I'm so proud to be on this panel. I think my chest is going to burst. <laughs> um, my name is T. Bowie, and I'm a cartoonist. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, I, I went to Cal from 1993 to 98. Um, five years because I was a double major like a good immigrant kid. Um, <laughs> double majored in art, that was for me, and legal studies, which actually was not for my parents, that was also for me. Um, I, I wanted to do both. Um, and I also spent a year abroad, so I really like to pack things in. Um, I, I, I really do think that getting, you know, especially as a refugee kid, getting to go to university was always one of my favorite ways to enjoy nice things without having any money. Um, and so this is something that I practice later in life too. I still come by the life sciences building to use the bathroom. <laughs> it's one of the best ones on campus. And um, I used to take my little son when he was a toddler to go see the, the dinosaur bones here. Um, I did not get to take any Asian American studies classes when I was here. I actually had to apply to get past the unit ceiling because art and legal studies had no overlapping classes. Um, the one ethnic studies class that I took as a freshman changed my life. It was a survey of the student movements of the 60s and it rocked my world. Um, we would stand up at the end of every lecture. The professor was Carlos Munoz. And really inspiring. We would stand up and give them a standing ovation at the end of every class. And then there were there was a group of about uh, 15 or 20 of us who created an extra section at night uh, with a volunteer TA so that we could do extra readings and discuss them in greater detail. Um, that was how much that class meant to me. And the other, actually, one more class I got to take in the Asian American Studies Department was later on when I was already a parent and a teacher, a high school teacher in Oakland. Uh, there's, a summer, there's a summer scholars program where K through 12 teachers can take up to eight units uh, for free. Um, and I took Spanish one because I needed that to communicate with my students' families. And then I took a creative writing class for me. And that also changed my world because the professor was uh, the writer Fabian Ng. And she demonstrated to me how you could take something like the Chinese Exclusion Act and uh, weave it into something magic with words that made people feel and understand things differently. And uh, so I, was, I happened to be working on the first chapter of The Best We Could Do while I took her class. So I thank her for uh, being a, a role model for me. So The Best We Could Do is in uh, it's a, it's a graphic memoir, and it is also a vehicle for me to ask some questions about identity uh, that I didn't get to ask when I was a 23-year-old MFA student at Bard College. Um, I came, and I thought it would be a good idea to tell my professors there that I was interested in exploring my Asian American identity. This was in 1998. I had a professor tell me, or ask me very aggressively, why should I care about your Asian American identity? Um, I was 23, so I didn't have the wherewithal to retort to him all the things that I would say as a sassy 43-year-old now. <laughs> well, one of the things, if I could go back in time, would be why would I? Why should I have to read 10,000 versions of Catcher in the Rye? What well, I do? Um, I understand white male angst, particularly from the New England area, quite well. <laughs> I am, so let me tell you. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of anger, and the book also took me a long time to do, so some of the anger subsided over the years and turned into something more productive, which was me trying to analyze or, or better understand my parents and who they were um, before they had me. And through that process, that very personal process of understanding my parents, my family, my origins, also understanding the history of a country that was torn apart. Um, and for me, as a storyteller, I took um, there was a lot of power, a lot of agency in how I told the story. So these refugee photos are real, and uh, most people who came over as refugees from Vietnam will recognize the, the style of these photos. Um, 
in my book, you don't see these until almost the end. And that was important for me to um, develop characters who were real people before they ever became boat people. Um, and then I also, uh, you know, I went there with the boat people story. I have a whole chapter that shows what it was like for, the, for us on the boat. Um, and also what it was like to leave people behind. And what it's like to live with this experience in your past, how it always affects your relationships and your family, how it never really leaves you, even if you can't talk about it at a cocktail party or over coffee without making somebody get really depressed. Um, I used my power as a storyteller to only give two pages of real estate to all of the terrible stereotypes that I had to grow up with in the back of Vietnam War movies that we watched. We always watched them with a hopefulness that maybe this one would be better, but they were all bad. Um, <laughs> This book, uh, I've been asked why a graphic novel. Well, I can draw for one and I can write. And also, a graphic novel is the cheapest way to make a film, so this book is my revenge against all of the bad Vietnam War movies that I grew up with. And then, of course, there is the story of um, figuring out how to live here as a new refugee immigrant family. Um, I used empathy to try to do it, try to put myself in my parents' shoes um, and not just interview them as my parents. I did a lot of reading to fact check my parents because memory is, you know. Um, and I got upset a lot at the things that I had to read. The sources that were available to me sometimes were highly problematic. Stanley Carno is not a great historian. Um, but I also can use my power as a storyteller to comment on that and to Trojan horse into this personal family story a lot of critiques of, of those historical narratives that people have become used to and to point out their flaws, one of which is there are very few Vietnamese people featured in documentaries about the Vietnam War. Um, or texts about the Vietnam War. Um, and then finally, I can use my agency as a storyteller to take over, to not let us always remain in the shadows of larger hands playing chess with our lives. We don't have to be those ants running away from danger. We can also be the masters of our own, our own narratives. We can witness, we can document, We can make things for the next generation. Um, after I finished The Best We Could Do, I had the opportunity to illustrate a um, children's book by a slam poet who also uh, is my age. Uh, his name is Bao Fi, some of you may know. Um, we want a Caldecott for this book. So it's in every library. Um, the best we could do is also require reading for many freshmen across the country. Um, that's also my revenge. <laughs> um, so now there are a lot of folks reading about the Indian refugee families from the 70s and 80s. Um, and I get to put in, uh, you know, my dad shows up as my dad and also Bao's dad. I don't, you know. Um, there are things that I learned from uh, you know, reading many books by white males, um, some of them are very good, like uh, Murray Sendak's In the Night in the Kitchen is full of paraphernalia that evokes, um, you know, this Jewish American life in New York that's so specific, and I wanted to make that for folks like me. And so there's less stuff because we were refugees and nobody had anything. But there are some very specific things like the goi o, the, the hugging pillow, um, you know, the bare light bulbs, the free calendar on the wall from the supermarket, um, the, 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 the clothes from the 1970s, although it's the 1980s because you've got hand-me-downs from the church. 
um, the haircuts, the, um, the, the, the knockoff Adidas, the Jake bracelet, the, this, is, this is actually very specifically uh, Midwestern, the tater tot hot dish, which I had to look up because I'm from California, but um, that and the jello with the fruit inside, I guess are, Val told me they're very, um, they would speak to the folks who were sponsored by the Lutheran Church. <laughs> um, the, the milk mountain, the fish sauce in a, uh, an old mayonnaise jar. Um, these are in the end papers of this children's book, and I hope that even though I don't necessarily name them all specifically, they enter into the lexicon of American um, nostalgia. You know, why can't we have our own nostalgia? Based on our own memories and our own childhood pictures, And then at the same time that we indulge in this nostalgia for ourselves, which is very comforting, we also have to reach out and extend to the newer immigrants and the newer refugees uh, because they don't have a lot of time and lives are on the line. So um, in January of last year, I was asked to do a comic uh, for a um, collection of, of comics called State of Emergency, and I didn't mind about refugees specifically Syrian refugees who are the newest boat people. And I won't read it to you, but you can find it online. And it was this little boy, Alan Curdy, who was also three years old when his family packed him onto a boat. Um, I was three years old and I made it, and he did not, and he haunts me every day. Um, there is a uh, there is a, a scary overlap between um, refugees and climate change right now that I just want to take a minute to address. It is it was going to be my next book. I had a book deal and everything, and I I just came back from from Vietnam doing research about climate change in the Mekong Delta. Um, and it, had, it presented some, some challenges in terms of the research. And then I came back in November of last year to uh, raids on the Southeast Asian community um, by ICE. Um, and so uh, I had to make a tough decision. Um, while the sea is rising and climate change is undeniable, um, I had to take a step back and deal with a domestic crisis that is still related, but I have to, I have to squeeze a different book in between. So the, um, the new book is actually about uh, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, in particular Southeast Asians, and uh, immigration detention and deportation. So I'm really excited to talk to you, Nhi. Um, and also I want to thank Asian Law Caucus for having two lawyers who are so persistent um, and also Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta for having a really ideal, idealistic young new litigation director who was dealing with the Vietnamese community at the same time as Asian Law Caucus was dealing with the Cambodian community. Um, Asian Law Caucus lawyers reached out to me in December and asked me if I could help publicize um, the class action lawsuit. And at the time, this was just last December, I didn't know anything about how to stop deportation and I felt quite helpless but I can read really fast. Um, so I read as much as I could, and the more I read, the madder I got. And then I also like to do things quickly if I can. So I told them, you know what, send me some bullet points about one of your lead plaintiffs and a photograph, or a few photographs. And I can make a drawing and like write up something simple, and I will post it tomorrow. So that's what I did for Moni Neth, um, who actually has been pardoned by the governor, so he's, he's free and with his family now. Um, that got a surprisingly good response, so I did another one about a Vietnamese guy in Georgia who is separated from his five-month-old baby. Um, and uh, he has also actually since been released by ICE, um, but his road to a pardon is a lot more complicated. 
Um, after that, I knew that I couldn't just keep doing the same trick again. I needed to go deeper, and so I, um, I pitched a story to the NIB, which is a, an online uh, hub for comics journalism, political comics. Um, it's a cousin of The Intercept. Uh, and they allowed me to spend more time researching the laws that we have that create these conditions for people who came over as refugees like me to end up in ICE detention after spending, let's say, 20 years for something that they did as a juvenile. Um, and I learned a lot. And I'm hoping to be, sh to be able to share this with people along the way as I'm working on the book. Comic books take forever, but advocacy uh, demands um, thing is now, and so um, some of these images are ending up in the community as, you know, hot off the press, like as soon as I finish them, I email them out to folks. So this one, um, this one says, this is a man who was released from prison, from San Quentin last year, um, after spending over 20 years in prison. He said, we invest in people. We believe in the goodness that exists in people because we were also a group of people who waited 20 to 30 years, some longer, for others to invest in us, to see the value in us. We as a whole society can move humanity forward through how we show up and what we can do for each other. And this, um, is hanging in one of the, um, lo the lobbies at Asian Health Services. Um, he's an ambassador, a Chinatown ambassador for Asian Health Services because they have a wonderful program um, that provides employment opportunities for re-entry folks to give back to their community. Um, and it's not that they have to be persuaded. I, through working with Asian, Asian Prisoner Support Committee, um, which is another organization that has roots in Asian American studies. Yuri Kochiyama was one of the founders, um, along with an incarcerated man who was put in solitary confinement for demanding that there be an ethnic studies program at San Quentin State Prison. Um, that's how Asian, Amer Asian Support Committee was created. Um, and now I, I work with its members, and I gotta say, these are the people that will change the culture of the, the youth who are at, at risk, who can change the lives of the young men who are inside. I've been to San Quentin and I've gone to the Roots program. It's, it's called Roots, it stands for Restoring Our Own Original True Selves. And it is amazing to come into San Quentin. You go through um, this old tiny metal gate that feels horrible and then you walk through the yard, which feels very scary because everybody has to look really hard and it's very racially segregated. And then you walk a little bit further between some chain link fences and you come to a small bungalow where there are these potted plants and flyers and posters for things that are good for you. Um, so it makes my public teacher heart feel very, you know, um, warm. And then you come in and there is a, uh, a group of young men, young and old men, in a circle, in uh, the San Quentin uniform, but they all have their own personal flair to it. And they're sitting in a circle, and they bring you a chair right away, and then they start learning about Vietnam or Cambodia, and they are teaching each other. Some of them have done research just a few days before their presentation, and um, again, I was a high school teacher for, for over 10 years, it's, 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 it's amazing to see. And that's just the first, um, the first part of their curriculum. After, they, after they've um, learned about each other's cultures in this really wonderful way, then they start looking at the bigger picture and understanding their history and assimilation and intergenerational trauma. And then they start getting more complex and they start talking about um, anti-blackness or um, the patriarchy, and they transform. I've been told uh, by, these, yeah, by these men who are now counselors, um, 
community leaders, um, that I've asked them, so what changed you? Because if, you know, the system is not set up for rehabilitation, what changed you? And they all point to this roots program. And this roots program inside is Asian American studies, it's ethnic studies. And it, it makes um, young men who would be lost into leaders who are really the only ones with the experience um, and the connection to reach back and change the lives of other young men who are there. Um, one of them is named Bore, Bore I. He's, we, we call him by his nickname PJ. And uh, so this is an excerpt from the book that who knows when it's going to be out. Maybe next fall, maybe next spring. Um, but in the meantime, bits of it are coming out as advocacy work. So this campaign um, has made it all the way to Sacramento. We're actually going back to Sacramento on Tuesday for PJ's uh, parole board hearing. Um, and uh, one of the things that I get to do as not quite a journalist, but as a writer, is to take a step back and distill some of the issues. So one of the issues uh, that PJ's life story touches upon is the cycle of violence that refugees are brought into and, and keep reliving unless something, someone helps them break out of the cycle. So PJ's mother is a victim of genocide uh, by the Khmer Rouge. She watched her husband, her brother, her father um, killed with machetes and buried alive, um, fled to a Thai refugee camp met another man, had PJ and two, two other uh, children with him, lost a child on the way to the Thai refugee camp, really has suffered enough. But um, when she came to the US, uh, she settled in Stockton, where there is a Khmer community where she could feel supported, but Stockton was a really rough place. And on top of the poverty and the gangs and the bullying that you know, the newer refugees dealt with in school and on the streets all the time. There was a horrible um, school shooting that some of you may know about that happened in the 80s uh, when, when PJ was just a little kid. So all of the children who were killed in the school shooting were Southeast Asian refugees. Um, PJ's cousin was one of them. And he saw it happen. If, you know, so all of the all of the guns and the bombs and the violence that folks fled, they sort of came back here, and then folks had to survive, right? They have to just do something, and so the gangs provided a safety net on the one hand, and then the gangs also created a pipeline into county jail, state prison, life imprisonment, and that in combination with some really harsh laws that were being created in the 90s, created this entire system where many of our youth who did not fit the model minority narrative ended up in this other narrative. Um, and what I'm trying to do right now is to not forget them and to tell their story too and, and to um, remind people that those are our brothers and our sisters and our cousins um, and they are part of the Asian American picture too. So um, if you'd like to support them, they're having a fundraiser right now. Um, um, so Asian Prisoner Support Committee, uh, Asian Law Caucus, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, um, thank you so much for the foundation that you've created, Asian Health Services, for expanding um, the work into so many aspects of people's everyday lives. Um, us artists will just keep doing what we can to tell the stories, make them visible, make them understandable. <laughs>